We are successfully infiltrating the state of Texas. Speaking of Texas, Big 12 media, what are we doing? When are we ever going to learn? Are we just giving them a boost right before we give them the boot? Because otherwise, this don't make no daggone sense. You are Locked On Oklahoma State, your daily podcast on the Oklahoma State Cowboys. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Howdy, y'all, and hello, all. Welcome back to Locked On Oklahoma State, your daily stop for all things cowboy and cowgirl related. My name is Cody Stovall. I want to thank you kindly for stopping by to make this your first listen here on Locked On Oklahoma State. We're available on every single plot. Whether the words are hard for me, podcasting platform, as well as visually on YouTube, you can find me on Twitter at All Day O State. We're brought to you by Fandle. Here's the dealio, ladies and gentlemen. As you see by the little. Uh, I don't know, a little Dilly Mahabi up there that says back in Texas hotbed for those watching visually. That's what we're going to talk about. But we're also going to talk about the fact that the Big 12 media just did their preseason poll. And you guessed who's number one, which we're going to get to. But as it pertains to Oklahoma State University at this very moment, we are, in fact, infiltrating the state of Texas. And goodness me, does it feel good. It does. You know, for a long time, most of our time, we got almost all of our talent from the state of Texas, right? We'll just call a spade a spade. It is what it is. And recently, we've kind of, I don't want to say been forced to, I would say almost we've been able to, right? Conduct our recruiting in, in way more states and have way more success than ever before. So, it's gone from a uh, complete reliance. Like we had to get some of the diamonds in the rough from the state of Texas that Texas did not want. I mean, that's a fact and build them up. But luckily we have body by glass. So we were able to do that for years and years and years and years and years. Well, you, you heard people talking in the last season, the recruiting class from the high school ranks was not great, right? We've talked about it. It was pretty much abysmal. Our transfer class is going to bail us out. That's phenomenal. What we have cooking right now defensively is phenomenal. And I, I'm a big fan of what we're doing offensively right now at the moment as well. But right now, Oklahoma State is doing more in the DFW, Dallas-Fort Worth area than anybody else around. Right? We are absolutely killing it right now. And, and specifically, obviously, on the defensive side of the ball. But when you look at geographically and you look at what Texas has going on, at the moment, Oklahoma State University has seven DFW Texas recruits committed. TCU, in their own backyard, has three. Texas A&M has exactly zero. And when you look at it, Texas, TCU, Texas A&M combined have less DFW Texas guys committed than Oklahoma State University. And people have said, why don't we go back to the, the fertile, rich grounds of Texas? Well, I'll tell you, we had a little bit of a, a little bit of a perception we, we had to deal with, right? We had a little bit of negativity that was swirling around that clearly we, we've gotten ahead of. This is a sign of great things to come. This is absolutely massive. And, and we already know, Landon Cleveland, offered by Texas also offered by TCU. You look at uh, somebody like Tameric Johnson, we had to fight off a lot for. Trey Griff- Griffiths out of Te- Keller, Texas, we had to fight off a lot of teams for. Armstrong Notum is going to be a beast down low. David Cabongo from Trophy Club was also offered by, by Texas. Gunnar Wilson went from not rated to three-star to committed. That fast, right? His recruiting process was very simplistic. Thank the heavens. Jonathan Agumadu, also from Texas, massive get for McKinney. And then a lot of these guys also had offers from Baylor and Tech and, and, and A&M to some degree, right? We are winning right now in the state of Texas. And I think there's going to be more to come. 
I really do. Well, we could talk about the quarterback position and Malachi Smith. And by the way, we'll, we'll get to it in another episode. Probably don't have time here, obviously. But uh, if we don't get Malachi Smith, Malachi Smith, I am actually very, 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 very happy with getting River Warren. He's a local. He's an Oki. I like the way he plays the game. Reminds me a little bit of J.W. Walsh. I'm a fan there. So if that works out, it does. And God, But let's not stress. We realistically don't need to take a QB in this class. I'm telling you. As long as everybody stays, um, we're more than fine at that position. It's a position of strength that people haven't had the opportunity to basically see yet. So sign me up on the, the excitement meter. And when you think about this, right, we've got a few Okies involved as well. Josh Ford from Stillwater, obviously. Rodney Fields from Dell City. Uh, Xavier Benson, or Xavier Robinson, also you know from the Carl Albert area. He's going to be going to OU. But... Everybody said Devon Jordan, the number one defensive back in the state of Oklahoma, is not only beyond a bad mamma jamma, but he was OU lean, OU lean, OU lean, OU lean. Don't even try. But I'm, I'm hearing that Oklahoma State has his interest. Like, there's a legitimate consideration here that Oklahoma State has kind of climbed, and he's got it percolating in there, right? He's got the juices marinating, and it's all percolating around. He's trying to figure it out. We're all massive fans of Whit Edwards. I would lo love almost nothing more than him to come to Oklahoma State University. I think he would be a massive, massive get on the defensive side of the ball. Love his versatility. Love the fact that he does play on the offensive side of the ball. I'm actually surprised that this isn't already a done deal because we have a good pipeline with Wagner. We have a good relationship. He's a legacy, right? Family attended Oklahoma State University. He's got a sister that's there right now. But... He's getting a lot of love from a lot of players. You're talking Michigan-style love, and that does weigh on these kids. That is a big deal. Some of them want to get out of Oklahoma. I hate it. It bothers me. It hurts my heart, but it is what it is. I think LaDainian Fields is a very, very, very good option as a, as a wide receiver. But Texas, what are we doing? What are we doing? Big 12 media, their preseason poll has, of course, obviously Texas at number one. I'm... I'm not okay with it, but I could half half A be okay with it if they didn't have 41 flipping fracking votes. Like, why do we do this to ourselves every single year as quote unquote media people? And I didn't get a vote. Cody Nagel did. Good job, brother man. This is ridiculous. There is nothing other than the star rankings that they got from high school that gives you any indication that Texas is going to be really good. Now, let me give this, this prerequisite here. I think they're going to be very good. I firmly believe that. My problem is, again, this force-fed SEC Texas bullcrap. That's what I have a problem with. 41 votes? Are you, are you serious right now? They struggled mightily last season. Again, I think they're going to be really good this year. But 41 votes when Kansas State only gets 14? TCU only gets three? OU four? Texas Tech is a surprise here with four votes. But I, you guys already know, I think Reckham Tech is going to be a, a big, big problem for everybody in the Big 12 in the next couple years, next few years. I, I think this year could be a little, little, little uh, trial and error with them. But... They're coming, so I'm okay with that. And then you got Baylor at six, and then obviously our Cowboys of Oklahoma State at seven with one vote. Good looking out, Cody. We're ahead of UCF. They're eight. That makes sense. I, I, I buy that. KU right there at nine. Uh, I'm cool with that, right? I would actually put KU above UCF for sure. I would probably put KU above Baylor, to be honest with you. We don't know what Aranda's going to do, and we know that they're dang sure not going to fill up the stadium and come support their team. Then you got Iowa State at 10, BYU at 11, Houston 12, Cincy 13, West Virginia 100, uh, 14. Sorry. Um, yeah, I don't necessarily agree with the bottom of this list either. BYU should be above Kansas, should be above UCF, should definitely be above Baylor. You could argue that BYU could be ahead of us. I don't, I'm not saying that, but you definitely could. So 11 for BYU, preposterous. Houston. 12, I get it. Cincinnati, 13, I get it. West Virginia, 14. I think West Virginia is going to be more in the 11, 12 range. Okay, I do. Um, I, I think Houston probably is going to have a rough adjustment. 
even though their first team is going to be as competitive as anybody's, it, the depth there is going to be a problem. Same with Cincinnati. I think people are assuming that with BYU, but I don't know why we would assume BYU is going to struggle with depth when they're, they're all grown A men. I mean, these guys are squared away, 23, 24, 25, 26 years old. They've already been through some life experience. They've already traveled the, the world. They've already done things. They get it, right? The, the, the accountability, continuity, things of that nature, they're squared away in that department, which is typically why you see BYU capable of making some runs because they're a mature, talented team that understand the complexities of life. Their cerebral cortex is almost developed, if not fully developed, by the time they graduate from BYU. Most of us young kids, young cats, young guys out there, yes, I just called myself young. It felt nice, too. You know, we're all trying to, to, to hang on to stuff. So the, the more you can hang on to it and the more you can do with it, obviously, the better you've got to exploit it while you can. Another thing that we should all probably be prepared to exploit is FanDuel. You already know. Right now, you can get your hands on up to $200 back in bonus bets. If your first bet does not win, you naturally need to go to the website, right? And you need to get hooked up. FanDuel.com slash locked on. It's full swing. It's baseball season. I love it. I'm a fan. I'm happy. We actually just got back from a baseball tournament. Shout out to, to, to my boy. He pitched a, a beauty, a 10K, five-inning five game. We got the W, 9-1. to one. Uh, and then he hit a, what would have been a walk-off game winner. And then the umpire just randomly added an extra inning, and it kind of, uh. Anyways, there's lots of things to bet on. You need to go right now, fandle.com slash locked on, to get your money right. Hammer the over on Oklahoma State. Hammer the over on whatever the preseason poll has us at, because it doesn't matter. This is your opportunity, my opportunity, all of our opportunities to make some money, honey, Go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to get yourself that up to $200 back in bonus bets. All right, so now we'll move on to the little ticker uh, number two thing in the hobby. Obviously, that's going to be Eric Daly Jr. Now, we, we've got to talk about this because you see exactly how special he can be. You know, he, he dropped a, a dozen burger for him the other day to help him get a dub. Uh, and then we hit a couple uh, setbacks. And obviously, this is pertinent to Oklahoma State, not only because it's Eric Daly Jr. playing for Team USA, but our own Coach Mike Boynton was also there as well. They started very, very hot. They were dominating everybody, 5 nothing, And then um, they had a, a really, really bad loss, honestly, to France. It was pretty, pretty horrendous. And it, 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 was, it shouldn't happen. And then we had an even worse setback after that against Turkey. It is what it is. Uh, he made a very good account for himself. Ladies and gentlemen, I've said it before. I'll say it again. He's not Kate Cunningham. All right, so let's not get that thing rocking and rolling. But he's Kate Cunningham-esque. As in, he can do what is necessary at the time to benefit the game, which obviously benefits the team. If he needs to drop a dime, done deal. If he needs to dunk it, done deal. Rebounds, steals, assists, whatever. He shot 50% from the floor. He averaged almost 10 a game, 4.3 4 rebounds a game, a block a game, a steal a game, 17 minutes a game. He does a little bit of everything. And it's impressive to watch. This is going to be a make or break year for Mike Boynton. It needs to be a make or break year for Mike Boynton. But can Bryce Thompson take that next step? If so, it's a good start. If Is Eric Daly Jr. going to be this consistent, this reliable, and this dependable when the season comes into play? Um, odds are yes. At 6'8", 230, he's, he's got a lot, a lot of stuff figured out here. Um, you know, Jarius Hicklin, he's interesting. I remember talking to you know, Doug Gottlieb, really likes him. When we had Doug Olive on the show, he, he talked about this guy being a surprise kind of steal of a get. So I cannot wait to see what he does. We saw last year what Keon Williams was able to do, even though it was, you know, small, small doses. Javon Small, East Carolina transfer. I think he's going to be the guy that we've kind of missed as far as the facilitator. 
the point man, the guy who's going to run the show, the offense that can also score, the offensive leader, the quarterback per se, that can also put the, the ball in the hoop. It's going to be massive. He's going to be spelled quite a bit by John Michael Wright, which is a phenomenal idea. But Javon Small does offer some things that we haven't had. Connor Dow, six foot six, 200 pound sharpshooter. Are you kidding me? Jamron Keller, a lot of Byron Eton, a lot of ice likely. It's going to be fun to see his development. Carson Sager still there, senior, one of the fan favorites. Justin McBride, former five star, blue, blue chip, prep, all American. Had an injury, put on some weight, got away from basketball for a little bit, got into it a senior year again. This is a potential five-star guy that we got basically because people rid him, wrote him off. He's here to not make a scene, but make a point. We know Brooks Manzer can come in and, and spell some relief here and there. Uh, I think a lot of us expect Brandon Garrison to be a dude an absolute beast. And again, we know that he's got a frame to grow into. If y'all seen some of the highlights of his Isaiah Miranda, oh my goodness gracious, seven foot one, 220 pounds jumping. His vertical is absolutely insane. You don't expect somebody seven one to have this level of athletic ability and hops. He's a lot like Musa Cisse with way more athleticism and a much better shot. And then we got Mark Marsh, right, early on. If you watch the, his film from Jacksonville, small school, but you want to dominate at that level if you're that guy. He was that guy. He dominated. It's fun to see. It's going to be fun to watch. We know what John Michael Wright provides. And then you got um, people like Weston Church and, and, and Nas Brown. Um, and Nas got to chip in a little bit last season. Nas is a very, very good competitor at practice, and he brings a lot out of these guys, makes them bring their A game on a daily basis. All positive. So, again, this is a make-or-break year. I'm one of those people that, to me, with this roster, yes, it's super, super, super duper young, but the talent, we're more talented than last year by quite a bit. Now, are we going to be able to utilize that talent appropriately? I think so because this is Mike Boynton's cup of taters. He's not a half-court set dude. I mean, he's gotten much, much better at it, so thank you for that. Got to tip the cap. But that's not his cup of tea. If he can have a track meet, simultaneously as the basketball game's going on, he's a happy man, and I'm fine with it. It helps with the pick and pop. We were all enamored and obsessed with the three-point line, but if you're on fast break and you have those opportunities and you have the shooters to do it, fine. Pull the trigger. Go ahead. Let's rock and roll. This year, we should have a little bit more of that. We're going to have a, a lot more of the shooting uh, capabilities, obviously, but, you know, it's just it's intriguing to me to think that some people are okay with making the tournament. No, goodness me. No, absolutely not. I don't care what the turmoil was, situation was. We've had plenty of time. Plenty of time. We've given Mike Boynton plenty of time. He probably knows that this season is massive. It doesn't matter about the youth. I mean, it does matter, but we're going to have to find a way to make sure it doesn't matter in the end. It cannot come up and bite us. The, the youth is going to have to play like upperclassmen. We have to get him there, right? We we have to get these youth to that level. I think that we can, especially with somebody like Eric Daly Jr. Hopefully, Bryce has kind of got that, that next step figured out. Keon's doing nothing but improving. A lot of these freshmen are going to play. Getting Miranda, Isaiah Miranda was just, man, that that's, that's the coup of all coups. I, I just, hats off. Hats off, Mike Boynton. Well, I'm not going to take my hat off because I'm bald as all get out. But hats off to Mike Boynton, all right? And then uh, lastly, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's talk a little bit about Omaha because our Cowboys are going to be pretty good. And I, I think you could all say it's another you know make or break type situation because if this year we do not get it done, to me, it's a problem. It may, maybe it's just me, but to me, it's a problem. Like, hands down, absolutely, no doubt. As we've got some guys, like, congratulations, Victor Medeiros. He went up very, very, very quickly. Now he's in the majors playing with Anaheim. And, uh, yeah, it's pretty magical to see. Christian Cardenacion is absolutely tearing the cover off the baseball in AAA. He'll be there soon. Jackson Holiday, he's not going to hes, he's gonna be making appearances very, very quickly in the major leagues right here, right now. 
We've got some guys that are making some noise in the baseball world. So what does that what does that mean? It means that we've got some capabilities that I, I don't think everybody's aware of. I think we've we've got some abilities here. Now, no matter what you lose, it, it, it matters what you bring in. And I don't know if you guys saw recently, but we got an Xavier transfer, Ethan Bossacker. And the kid's good, right? He threw almost 100 innings, 3.49 ERA. His nickname was like the Iron Man because he had a couple complete games. He only allowed 82 hits and 38 earned runs all year, striking, striking out 101 batters to only 29 walks. He only allowed 10 doubles and 13 home runs in two seasons. Or in the last season, sorry. He pitched a complete game in the regional. And he kept them alive before they got beat out by Oregon. Overall, this kid is a, is a stud. If you're looking for a potential replacement, if... Jerron Watts Brown, you know, goes ahead and does his thing. This is perfect. This is absolutely perfect. And then we also picked up an all world shortstop from Mississippi State. Like, this is huge. I think that might be some of the indications, you know, writing on the wall type thing for Marcus Brown. Yeah, of course. But y'all tell me down in the comment section, is this, to me, it's just like Mike Boynton. It's more than just winning one game. To me, not, not just getting to the tournament. It's ludicrous. We have to win at least one. I would say probably two. If we win two games in the NCAA tournament, boom. Bada bing, bada bang. It is what it is. Do your thing. Have your time. We love it. We absolutely love it. But. If not, I mean, come on. What are we doing? It's it's going to be fun to see what Rock Regio does and Nolan McLean does. It's going to see the development of some of the guys that we have. It's going to see it's going to be interesting to see kind of what happens with Marcus Brown. Where we've got a very very intriguing thing going on at third base right now because we got two legitimate bad A Division 1 starters playing the same position. Talent is is not not a problem, and we keep bringing in these big time pitchers to help out. We just we got to make sure we manage them better. That is not a secret. That is not you know uncommon knowledge. If you follow Oklahoma State baseball and you have the understanding of the game of baseball, especially from the pitching perspective, the frustration is more than warranted. It's insane how long we leave pitchers in. That, that's, to me, one of the biggest mistakes I see traveling the country playing baseball is that one thing is coaches leave their kids in too long. If you let a kid get the bases juiced, that's on you, right? If you get the bases juiced in a big-time situation and he can't get out of it and you're too late bringing the other guy in, that's on you. So I tell my kids all the time, losing happens, right? You should, I mean, it's not fun. It's not great. But it happens. And it's okay to some degree if it happens. But don't beat yourselves. That, that doesn't make sense. So do you tell me. Is it Omaha or bust? Are you guys okay with sharing sharing another Big 12 trophy? Let me know down in the comments. Like it if you liked it. Dislike it if you didn't. Tell me why you disliked it and what I could have done better. I think that's all we're going to have for this one, ladies and gentlemen. As always, I love you all. Dear Texas, you suck. All right, y'all. Thank you for tuning in today to make this your first listen here on Locked On Oklahoma State. Later, taters.